I've previously expressed skepticism about the benefits of vitamin D supplementation in MS and even published this video suggesting vitamin D is worthless, but I may have to eat my words as this randomized control trial showed that vitamin D supplementation versus placebo did reduce disease activity in people with MS. But how should we view this in the context of other evidence and how effective is vitamin D really and should you take it if you have MS, I'll give my personal opinion. So it's long been known that low vitamin D is linked to MS. For instance, this study on people with MS looked at the average number of new active lesions comparing people with low vitamin D less than 50 nanomoles per liter, the top line, which is 20 nanograms per milliliter if you're in the United States, a relatively low level of vitamin D that could be considered to be deficient. And they compared the number of new active lesions compared to people with higher levels of vitamin D the bottom line, people with greater than 50 nanomoles per liter, and people with higher vitamin D had less new lesions. This study looks at people with clinically isolated syndrome. These are people with a single demyelinating event, such as optic neuritis or transverse myelitis, who do not meet the full diagnostic criteria for MS. And we're looking at, on the y-axis, the probability of converting to clinically definite multiple sclerosis, either by having another attack or developing a new lesion on MRI scan. And if you look at the people with higher levels of vitamin D, the bottom line, greater than 50 nanomoles per liter, they have a lower risk of getting MS than people with lower levels of vitamin D. But these results could be due to confounding. In other words, a third factor correlated with both higher levels of vitamin D and better MS prognosis is actually driving the effect, such as better overall health or more ultraviolet radiation exposure, which has been associated with lower risk of MS in numerous studies. A better way to test vitamin D would be a randomized trial where the same people are randomized to get either vitamin D or placebo, and almost all of such studies show no benefit. For instance, this is Cochrane's evidence-based review looking at five randomized trials for vitamin D supplementation in people with MS, and it was ineffective. You can see there's a little variation from study to study that the average effect size was zero, a worthless treatment. This is the Prevan study, the basis of the provocative thumbnail I showed you earlier, vitamin D is worthless. It was a double-blind randomized trial in Australia and New Zealand in the aforementioned clinically isolated syndrome. Again, people with a single demyelinating event who don't meet the diagnostic criteria for MS. However, the diagnostic criteria have changed, and most people in this study would now be considered to have clinically definite it, relapsing multiple sclerosis, I'll spare you the technicalities. And they found that vitamin D was ineffective. This diagram looks at the outcomes in people receiving either placebo, zero international units, 1,000 international units of vitamin D3, 5,000 international units, or 10,000 international units. And the gray lines are people who were stable, did not develop MS. The black dot means they developed MS after a clinical attack, and the dark line means there's a new MRI lesion which gave them the diagnosis of MS where the lines end. And you can see there are no differences between the four groups. 10,000 international units of vitamin D3 versus placebo was worthless. But the delay trial, the basis of this current video, showed the opposite, that vitamin D is effective. And I give credit to Dr. Eric Sovenot, the first author of this excellent publication. They they again studied CIS, clinically isolated syndrome, in people age 18 to 55, and they had to have either DIS, or dissemination in space, meaning lesions in different areas of the nervous system, as is typical of MS, or a positive spinal tap with at least two antibodies, also known as oligoclonal bands, in the cerebral spinal fluid, but not in the blood, the findings seen in about 90% of people with MS. This was present in 203 of 240 people in the study, or 85%, out of a total of 303 people in the study. So most people did have a spinal tap. My personal opinion is they should have just excluded people with a negative spinal tap because in someone who doesn't meet the diagnostic criteria for MS who has a negative spinal tap, they might just not have MS. Interestingly, people in this study 
were not receiving disease-modifying therapy, most doctors throughout the world would have recommended disease-modifying therapy to most of the people in this study in modern times, but this study started in 2013 and things have changed a little bit. This is a French study with 36 different MS centers, and it was a double-blind, randomized trial, and they studied the dose of 100,000 international units of vitamin D3 versus placebo every two weeks for 24 months, but they would stop the study when disease activity occurs. This may seem like a huge dose, but it's the equivalent of 50,000 international units once weekly, a commonly prescribed dose, or about 7,000 international units once a day, less than the Prevan study I showed you a moment ago. I personally take 5,000 international units of vitamin D3 daily. And they excluded people who had higher levels of vitamin D higher than 100 nanomoles per liter or who had high calcium because vitamin D can increase calcium levels. They excluded sarcoidosis because sometimes the granulomas in sarcoidosis can activate vitamin D and cause high calcium and tuberculosis because it's thought that low vitamin D is linked to tuberculosis. So maybe people with tuberculosis need a vitamin supplement anyway. These are the baseline characteristics of people entering the study. The average age was around 34 and a half. Around 70% were women, and the average body mass index was around 24, and 9% or so had a history of mononucleosis, which is known to be associated with MS. 37% were smokers. That would be much higher than in the United States, of course. The vitamin D levels at baseline were higher in people who got randomized to vitamin D, 49.5 nanomoles per liter, versus only 42.5 who got randomized to placebo, just due to random chance. But this is a little bit of an imbalance in the study. People getting placebo were starting off with lower levels of vitamin D, and a higher percentage of people getting placebo had severe vitamin D deficiency, less than 30 nanomoles per liter, 27% at the start of the study versus only 19% who got randomized to vitamin D. They also looked at their EDSS score. EDSS is Expanded Disability Status Score, a measure of disability in MS research, and it was very low, one in both groups. It's a zero to 10 scale. And about 50% had less than nine T2 bright brain lesions on MRI, which is a fairly low number of lesions. So these people were healthier with less disease activity than the typical person with MS. Continuing with the baseline characteristics and looking at their MRI activity, about half of them did not have any contrast enhancing or active lesions on their initial MRI, but quite a few, around 40% had one active lesion and around 10% had two or more active lesions, and about a quarter of them had two or more lesions, not necessarily active on spinal cord imaging. And most of these people, as I mentioned earlier, would meet the 2017 McDonald's diagnostic criteria for multiple sclerosis, around 90% of these people. Now let's move to the results. The primary outcome of this study was survival with freedom from disease activity, meaning no relapses and no new lesions on MRI scans. So it's a pooled outcome, looking at freedom from relapses, clinical attacks, but also a radiologic outcome, no new MRI lesions. So everyone starts off with no disease activity, then over time some people have relapses or new lesions and they fail to survive, but people getting vitamin D, the yellow line, had less disease activity versus those with placebo, in fact 34% less, hence a hazard ratio of 0.66, and this was highly statistically significant with a p-value of 0.004. However, if we look at the data more closely, this is entirely driven by MRI outcomes, and there was no statistically significant difference in terms of relapses, what matters most to the person with MS. So let's say if we look at contrast-enhancing lesions. Now, in the article, they look at adjusted data, so partially adjusted data or fully adjusted data, and you can see partial adjustment means adjusting only for baseline contrast-enhancing MRI lesions, whereas the full adjustment adjusts for age, sex, T2 lesions, 
EDSS, plasma vitamin D levels, receiving IV steroids, and you really shouldn't do any adjustment in part of the primary analysis because this is a randomized trial. It's random who got vitamin D or placebo. And so by doing adjustments, you're just introducing this new confounder in my personal opinion. However, if you look at MRI activity, you can see contrast enhancing lesions in 29 out of 156 people who got vitamin D versus 50 out of 147 who got placebo, clearly this is a difference. And I assure you, you don't need to do any swirling of numbers to make this statistically significant. But if you look at relapses, they report a hazard ratio of 0.69 or 0.68, but it's actually 0.82 if you don't adjust for everything. So there were 18% fewer relapses in people who got vitamin D, but it wasn't statistically significant. They looked at a lot of other outcomes too. This is EDSS or Expanded Disability Status Scale, again, a measure of disability. Those getting the placebo went down by 0.14 on average versus minus 0.17 in those getting vitamin D going down in EDSS is a good thing, but obviously there's no difference. They looked at the PACENT, the Paste Auditory Serial Addition Test, a measure of cognitive function, no difference between the two groups. They looked at physical and mental health-related quality of life surveys, measures of anxiety and depression. There was no difference in any of these outcomes between vitamin D or placebo. However, the better MRI outcomes and the weak trend towards fewer relapses may favor taking vitamin D just in case. After all, it's incredibly safe at reasonable doses. They also looked at what factors predicted whether or not vitamin D would be beneficial. And most factors didn't have any influence. For instance, age greater or less than 36 made no difference. Male or female made no difference. Number of brain lesions didn't make a difference. People who had two or more active enhancing lesions on MRI didn't seem to benefit from vitamin D, though the sample size was quite small, only 15 in each group. Baseline level of disability didn't matter. Whether or not someone had oligoclonal bands, in other words, a positive spinal tap, didn't matter. But baseline level of vitamin D did matter, with those having greater than 30 nanomoles per liter had no benefit or no statistically significant benefit where people with very low levels of vitamin D, less than 30 nanomoles per liter, actually did have a benefit. And of course, this would make physiologic sense that the most efficient people stand the most to gain. They did look at side effects. There were two people with hypocalcemia, in other words, low calcium, a known side effect of vitamin D supplementation, but they were actually both in the placebo group. No one taking vitamin D had low calcium, the feared side effect. There were no instances of kidney failure. Very high doses of vitamin D can cause kidney stones and kidney failure. I actually do have a patient who is doing the Coimbra protocol, which involves very high doses of vitamin D supplementation for MS, and they did develop temporary kidney failure. So it can happen with very high doses. There were some reported severe adverse events in people who were randomized to vitamin D, such as appendicitis, a rare cancer called ameloblastoma, invasive ductal breast carcinoma, cellulitis infection of the skin, and gastric polyps, but I presume this was all random chance unrelated to vitamin D. So to end with my personal opinion, I'm still not convinced that vitamin D does anything for people with MS. Maybe it does a little bit and it's just very difficult to measure without a very large and prolonged trial because the treatment effect size is so marginal. It is nice they were able to measure something. In theory, the reduction in new MRI lesions should portend a lower rate of relapses and even less disability progression over time, but the effect may be very, very small. And remember, these people in France weren't treated with disease-modifying therapy. In people with MS taking highly effective disease-modifying therapy, the rates of relapses and new MRI lesions may just be so low that it's almost impossible to measure anything. 
That being said, I do think vitamin D is incredibly safe. For example, how much time would it take someone like me with type 1 skin to go out into the sun in a swimsuit in sunny Southern California where I live and get 7,000 international units of active vitamin D or the equivalent active levels in my blood that would be caused by that dose? Believe it or not, the answer is only around 5 to 10 minutes. So these really are physiologic doses of vitamin D and our ancestors had levels like this all the time just naturally without taking any supplements. I was just in Legoland earlier today with my kids, applied sunscreen three times, still got a little bit charred, such as life with type 1 skin, but I suppose it prevents vitamin D deficiency to some extent, as long as you don't wear too much clothing or spend too much time indoors. So I think vitamin D at reasonable doses is quite safe. Again, I take 5,000 international units of vitamin D3 for no particular reason except maybe to prevent osteoporosis, which I believe is also unproven. And my philosophy would be if there's any chance of it doing anything, it may be worth taking and hey it did do something in a randomized trial albeit it was entirely driven by mri outcomes but historically those have correlated with clinical outcomes as well now of course that's just my personal opinion you can talk to your own provider for personal medical advice i'd be interested to know do you take a vitamin d supplement which form do you take d3 or d2 how much do you take and do you actually believe it works or are you just taking it just in case and do you have suggestions for other videos.